Good morning. I just want to welcome you all to the church at Starkey Hills. We are so glad that you came and joined us today. I'm going to be doing the announcements. I've got a few, not as many as the last couple of weeks. We've tried to narrow that down. We have bulletins now. Um, but just a couple of the highlights that we want you all to make sure that you know. Coming up November 6th through the 8th is going to be a family mission trip to Kentucky. You can contact Clark about that. He's the uh, youth minister here. Um, it's going to be for students and their parents. We also need people who can help with insulation and sheetrock. It's not me, but it's some of you. So if you need to call Clark and let him know that you can help, um, that would be great. Also, we are now offering Financial Peace University. It's through, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Dave Ramsey. There was a slide on it earlier. Um, we It's normally like $100 or $150, but right now the church can waive the cost. We have a code, um, and it's online. If you want to contact Tim Stallings, he'll be able to help you out with that, get you registered, get you through the class. Um, Operation Christmas Child. There are shoe boxes right as you walked in on a table out under the awning. If you'll pick one of those up, or five, or ten, or twenty, however many you want to do, um, bring those back by Wednesday, November 18th. Pack the box, come bring it back. We supply the boxes, so it's very little work on your all's part, but just make sure to pick a few up on your way out. New winter service schedule. Um, it's, in the, it's in the bulletin, but we also want to let you know, coming up on November 1st, we're going to start changing things up a little bit. Inside services will be at 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Um, so if you come to the 1030 and you're like, I could get up earlier, you can come at 8. Um, and if you're like, no, <laughs> I can't, you can come at 11, come a little bit later. Um, and then we'll also have the drive-in service at 930 in between. We'll also start Life Group that, that same Sunday, November 1st at 930. Uh, there'll be a few classes that meet upstairs. So if you need a Life Group, you can get plugged in. Uh, you can ask Tim or anybody can come ask me. Um, about the different options because we have a lot going on. Also, um, on that same day, November 1st, it's just a big day all the way around, that evening from 4 to 7 is going to be the uh, Fall Festival at the Museum of Appalachia. It's the next exit up past Emory Road. It's off the North Clinton exit. You take off the exit, go the right a little bit. Um, from 4 to 7, there'll be food trucks, um, I think like three or four different food trucks. There'll be activities for the kids. So no matter your age, young, old, anywhere in between, you want to come, it's from 4 to 7 on November 1st. So you come, bring your neighbors, bring your family, bring your friends. So everybody's going to have a really good time. Um, the last one is deacon nominations. We have two deacon positions that need to be filled. So if you know somebody in mind, there are cards out uh, in the lobby that you can pick up, and you turn that in by next Sunday. We are so glad that you all are here this morning. Um, and if you will stand up, wave around at some different people, um, tell everybody hello as the band comes up and starts this morning. Thank you.
Amen. Let me get you to open your Bibles or your device to Daniel chapter 4 as we move through this amazing prophetic book found in the Old Testament, written over 2,600 years ago, and yet still 100% not just informative, but applicable for today's world, for our living today. And God is incredible how he writes an eternal word, a word that lasts for all of eternity. You see, in the future, as far as we can possibly imagine in that eternal realm, God's Word is still accurate, timely, and real. And so that's where we live today. So to title, the title of today's message is this, Watch the Point. Not what's the point. I didn't say that with an, an impediment. Watch the point. Now let me tell you what that's talking about. If we look at people's lives and we see what they point at most, we watch the point, it will tell a tremendous amount about the heart of the individual. And in today's passage, in today's chapter, we're going to see uh, what, what the King Nebuchadnezzar really was all about. 
at the end of his journey. And, and so uh, this illustration comes from this idea. All of us have watched NBA or NFL. I don't watch it much anymore. I'll leave the rest of the story unsaid. I just don't, I refuse to watch it much. But I remember in days when I did, you would see some seven foot tall guy who would run down low on the basketball court and someone would throw him an alley-oop. And man, he would grab it, swirl it around and slam it through the goal and come down, pound his chest like he just leaped across Norse Lake. And it's all about me. He gets in the face of the opponent, man. It's all about He seems to have forgotten when he's pointing at the greatness of who he is, first of all, that he's seven feet tall dunking on a 10-foot goal. That's like me freshly, and that's like me accurately dunking a pair of my underwear in the clothes hamper. Okay, And it's all about him. He forgets the DNA structure that gave him a seven-foot existence. He, he forgets that there was a point guard or someone who lofted that ball accurately up in the proximity of the realm, of the, of, of the, of the, uh, of the rim. And, and he forgets that it's not all about him. There's other people in the midst. And where it's like watching NFL and the guy runs into the end zone and he catches, maybe he lays out to catch it, but he catches this end zone ball and scores six points for his team. And then he gets up and spins the ball around, does the stanky leg or whatever it is, some kind of little dance, to, to uh, point to the glory of who he is, right? And he seems to have forgotten that there had to be a quarterback on the field who just happened to put the ball in the end zone where he could catch it. He seems to have forgotten that the guy that was defending him maybe got tangled up on his own shoes on the 20-yard line, and he was wide open in the end zone. And it all becomes a picture, a, a, point, a, 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 a point about who he is. And we were singing this, these songs earlier, and we've got to get to a place where it's not all about us. Now, it, it, sometimes it's easy, and we'll, we'll unpack this today, it's easy to be about me, me, myself, and I. Uh, Kendra, sometimes she says, your message was good, but it had way too much eye in it. You know, she, I say, get thee behind me, Satan. I just keep moving, okay? Actually, she, she's right. She's right. Sometimes I, I, I talk about it, and I don't mean for it to come across like about I or me or my. It's about what God is doing, but sometimes the word I sneaks in there, okay? And it becomes a, an I show. Why? Because I'm pointing at me. So watch the point, and it tells a lot about the heart of the individual. Now, the story today is going to be a, a story about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has been on a journey, and so far he doesn't have a personal walk with God. He has a spectator faith. He has the faith of other people. You remember in chapter 2, he had a dream and he was startled by it. And he had all of his magicians and sorcerers and diviners come through. And he had these two amazing questions for him. He said, I want you to tell me what I dreamed. That's a biggie. And then I want you to tell me what it means. They all said, dude, we cannot do that. Okay, there's nobody on earth can do it. Only God can do that. Daniel goes to him. He says, I got this thing. Okay, Daniel tells him what he dreamed. Daniel tells him what it means. All right, and in, in that chapter, chapter 2, we find Nebuchadnezzar really like worshiping the greatness of God from a distance. He says, man, your God is the great God. Your God does things that other gods don't do. Your God is amazing. He knows about God. He has a profession about God without a possession of God. He has a spectator view of the greatness of God. And then you move into chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, the, some of the Chaldeans come to him and they say, listen, you told everybody to worship the big skinny. That's what I named the 90 foot by a 9 foot statue in the middle of the plain of Dura, the golden statue. They refused to worship Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. They're godly Hebrew names. You know them by their Babylonian anti-ungodly names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't worship. And so he says, I hate it, fellas. We're going to heat up the furnace, and you're going in it. They get in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar comes looking, and he says, he took an inventory, and it was kind of funny. He says, uh, weren't there four? You know, he lost count after three. They say, yeah, there were, there, were, there were three. I mean, weren't there three? Yeah, there were three. Now there's four. And so they get them out. They don't even smell like smoke. And he's amazed by their God. So he tells everybody, listen, nobody talk bad about the God of, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So once again, Nebuchadnezzar had an idea about God. He had thoughts about God. He even had a profession about God. Still no possession. Now that's the world we live in today. Welcome to 2020. We have a lot of people in the world that talk about God and yet they don't know him. They know somebody else's God. 
they don't walk with him in a personal way. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was at the peak of his popularity, the peak of his success. He had conquered all these lands. He had accumulated tons and tons of wealth. And he had every reason to be about himself, but something happened. Now, today, if you watch many movies, a lot of times a movie or a show will start out, and they start out with the conclusion of the movie. And so they have this scene where something's going on, and it leaves you hanging, and then words come up on the screen, and they say, one year earlier, three weeks earlier, seven days earlier. That's what this is. They stole this from Daniel chapter 4. Because in Daniel chapter 4, it starts, Nebuchadnezzar is writing a speech to the world. It, Nebuchadnezzar wrote a speech to the world, a state of the union address for the whole world. And it's the, he begins with the conclusion, and then he fills in the blanks. Now, the first thing that I want you to see today is the pronouncement of a believer. The pronouncement of a believer. Watch what it says in verse 1. Something's happened in the, night, in the life of this king. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages a language groups that live in all that land, peace and prosperity. I am delighted. This is a testimony, okay? I am delighted to tell you about the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Okay, the pronouncement of a believer looks like this. It's not what God has done for somebody else. It's what God has done for me. He says in verse 3, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom will last forever and his authority continues from one generation to the next. Now, it's the pronouncement of a believer. Now, in this church today, meeting here earlier in the parking lot, we have a lot of people who claim Christianity. A lot of people who say they know God. A lot of people who act and would speak as if they have a relationship with God. But often, even in the church, there are people who have a faith, the faith, of someone else. They've never owned their own faith. They've never taken ownership of their relationship and their walk with God. They live in a world of spectator Christianity. Like, yeah, I know about it because somebody else has experienced it, and this is what it looks like, but it's just not really tangible to them. They don't walk in the grace of Jesus. They don't walk in an understanding of the eternal counsel of God's word. They just, they aren't there yet. So they, they elaborate and speak of an, somebody else's faith. Nebuchadnezzar gets it. Nebuchadnezzar, something has happened in his life where the switch is on. It, he's had a defining moment with God. He, he's had a cathartic moment that reached in the depth of his cold, callous soul and, soul and flipped the switch on and says, Wow, you're real and you're here for me? Now, that's where we have to be. Now, notice what he says at the end of that. I think in verse 3, he says, Listen, I am pleased to tell you what God has done for me. You know, in today's vernacular, we would say, Can I get a witness? Okay, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for a testimony. That's what God is looking for. Listen, church, it's time as Christians we came out of the closet. Everybody else is coming out of the closet, no matter what it looks like, okay? As Christians, we need to come out of the closet. We need to step into the light and begin to share our testimony. Now, let me tell you one, one way you can kind of know at times whether or not you have a real walk with God. You won't be as quick to talk about somebody else's experience with God you won't be as articulate about sharing somebody else's faith. But now listen to the pastor. When the God of the universe, the eternal, true and living Yahweh, when he sends his Holy Spirit, part of who he is, into your world and begins to stir in the depth of your soul, and you have this keen awareness of why is God speaking to me? And then when you hear the truth, about Jesus, his son, and how we have a relationship with God, and we can be right with God through Jesus. And all of a sudden, the light comes on, and we surrender to that. It looks like Nebuchadnezzar's life in chapter 4, where all of a sudden, man, in this world of brokenness, in the conversations we have in our family, in the conversations we have in our workplace or on our teams and in our schools and everywhere we go, all of a sudden, we have something to say. We can weigh in. And it sounds like this. Man, that's awful. But I'm pleased to tell you about what God did for me. Because what God did for me, he could do for you. The pronouncement of a believer. If you never share a testimony, 
If you never, if you never share what God has done for you, the question is, has he really done something for you? And if not, then this could be the day that he could. Now, number two, I want you to notice the preoccupation of humanity. Now Nebuchadnezzar is going to go back in time. He's going to say, all right, this is the conclusion, but I need to tell you how I got here. I need to tell you what, hap- what God did for me that I'm pleased to tell you about. And I'm telling the whole world about this, all languages and all peoples. I want everybody to know it. The preoccupation of humanity, it looks like us. Verse 4, he says, I... Nebuchadnezzar was relaxing in my home, living luxuriously in my palace. The preoccupation of humanity is ourself and our comfort and our contentment and our prosperity. Now, you know it's true. You are more interested in you than you are the person next to you. And really the only exception to that is when you have small children and then when you have grandchildren. And all of a sudden they become the focus. But for the most part, our, our default Uh, mode is to be all about me myself and I it's 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 the nature of who we are if you know somebody close to you that that is that way say amen amen I know who you were thinking about your spouse listen don't say amen on that one do not say amen right there it's not a good place okay that's who we are our default mode is to be is, is to be just conscious about our own way and our own will and what makes us comfortable and what is in it for us it, it even creeps in the church here's what it looks like in the church uh yeah, i visited your church but uh that music man i i just don't like the new stuff you know i i like the old stuff yeah that's because you old yeah. i can say that because i am old okay uh, I, the music was just, it was too loud. It was too loud. It's because you have old ears, okay? Turn your hearing aid down, okay? Well, I, I, the, the preacher, he, he needs to, I want to be entertained. You see, I, I have an a ADHD, ABCDFG, and I can't pay attention. And so the, the, the pastor needs to really, like, in, in entertain me. I want to hear some funny stuff. And I, yet I want to hear the depth of the word. I heard somebody the other day, yeah, I, we just want more word. <laughs> When you get the word I shared, I'll give you some more. That's the way that works. Because there's more where that came from. Okay? Now, now that's what the world we live in. And and, and then we have children. We have babies. Now I want to come to church, and I want somebody to look after Junior. Okay? And I want him to be well taken care of. I want him to get some goldfish at the right time. But not not all goldfish, because they have an allergy. So I need the special goldfish, because Junior's special. Okay, and I want somebody to keep them. Now I ain't gonna keep them. I keep them all week long. Well, you should. They're yours. Okay, but I ain't sharing on Sunday. I'm not doing that. And then at the end of the day, they're gonna stand out there with a bucket. And I am so glad somebody else is paying for all this stuff to make me happy, because I ain't giving my money. About two thirds of the people never give anything, but they enjoy the benefits of somebody else's labor. Now, why? Because our default mode is the same. We end up, we begin, all of us, just like Nebuchadnezzar. I was in my palace enjoying my life. Everything was good in my hood. And that's when something cathartic, something significant happened. Listen, most people when they got saved, they say, well, you know, I I hit a hard time and I started just searching for the Lord. You don't have to search for the Lord. He ain't lost. You're lost. Okay? And he didn't lose you. But he comes and speaks into your soul. When I was 10 years old, taken to revival, I wasn't looking for the Lord. I went down there to count light bulbs to see if there was the same there on Tuesday night that there was on Monday night and Sunday night. I wanted to go down there and count who had brown hair, who had gray hair, who had no hair. I was down there for a whole different reason, and yet the God of the universe. I was in my little palace enjoying being content with my personal prosperity in my comfortable little world, and God of heaven reached down and said, that's not what I put you there for. And so there has to be a change. And this isn't the exception. It's the rule. It's not just me. It's not just Nebuchadnezzar. That's how we all begin. Number two, I want you to see that there's a prophetic will of God that you need to be aware of. You see, there's a God in heaven who has a way and a will for you. And a way and a will for all of existence. It's found right here in this book. Okay, and so now we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar is going back. He said, I was in my palace enjoying myself. 
But then there's a prophetic will that got, got introduced to me. I want you to read. We're going to read a lot of verses, so I need you to bear with me, beginning in verse 5. It says, I saw a dream that frightened me badly, and the things I imagined while, living on my, while lying on my bed, these visions of my mind were terrifying me. He goes on, he says, so I issued an order for all the wise men of Babylon to be brought before me so that they could make known the interpretation of the dream. Now, he hadn't met God yet. He just knows about God. It's not personal. It's a, pos it's a profession, not a possession yet. So what does he do? He goes back to the same losers as before. They didn't know anything before. They still don't know nothing today. Here's what it says. The magicians, the astrologers, the wise men, and diviners, they all entered. And I recounted the dream for them. But they were unable to make known its interpretation to me. Verse 8, later Daniel entered. Yeah, Daniel, the man of God, the person with God in him. He shows up. Whose name? is Belteshazzar after the name of my God in whom there is no spirit in whom there is a spirit of the holy gods now let me pause right there see ne Nebuchadnezzar knew something was different about Daniel now Daniel was his Hebrew godly name okay he had named him Belteshazzar about an ungodly Babylonian God but he knew there was something different about him so what is how does he define it because he doesn't know God he says the, the, the spirit of the gods lowercase g the, the, the pantheon of gods, okay, the lowercase e, there's, some, there, there's a spirit of those gods are in him. Daniel would say there is no gods out there. Certainly they're not in me. He has one God in him. Now it says he recounted the dream for him as well. Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, this is Daniel, in whom I know there to be a spirit of the holy gods in whom the mystery baffles, consider my dream that I saw and set forth its interpretation. Here are the visions of my mind while I was on my bed. While I was watching, there was a tree in the middle of the land, and it was enormously tall. And the tree grew large and strong, and its top reached far into the sky. It could be seen from the borders of all the land. And its foliage was attractive, and its fruit was plentiful. And on it there was food enough for all. Under, the wild animals, uh, under it, the wild animals used to seek shade, and its and in its branches the birds of the sky used to nest and all creatures used to feed themselves from it. Man, this is, okay, then pause right here. Here's what he's saying. He says, man, I'm, see, I'm laying in my bed. I'm having a dream, a vision, and I'm seeing this enormous tree, and it's beautiful. The foliage is beautiful. The fruit is amazing, and, and, and all, everybody, there's enough for everybody to live on. The animals are sh in the shade. The birds are nesting, and it's a beautiful picture of success and prosperity. But he says, while I was watching in my mind's vision on my bed, a holy sentinel, a messenger from God, an angel. He comes down and, and from heaven, and he says, he called out loudly. Now, the thing, everything's going to change right now. He says, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave its taproot in the ground. And with a band of iron and bronze around it, surrounded by the grass of the field. Let it become damp with the dew of the sky, and let it live with the animals in the grass of the land. Let his mind be altered from that of a human being, and let an animal's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time go for him. This announcement by the decree of the sentinels, this decision is by the pronouncement of the holy ones, so that those who are alive may understand that the Most High has authority. Now he's going to tell him why this vision is happening. Why Nebuchadnezzar's life is getting ready to change. Listen, when God tells us something, he, he often, he will tell us why. Sometimes we say, God, I don't know why you're doing this to me. You know. Now, God, I don't know why I'm experiencing this, going through this right now. You know. And if you don't know, he will reveal it. He doesn't punish and hurt us and make life difficult for no reason at all. He always has a prophetic will that he's operating, performing in our life. And so he says the Most High has authority over human kingdoms and he bestows them on whomever he wishes. He establishes over them even the lowliest of human beings. Verse 19 says, verse 19 should say, yeah, it's going to say. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was upset for a brief time, and his thoughts were alarming him. And the king says, Belteshazzar, he's speaking now to Daniel. He says, don't let the dream and its interpretation alarm you. Now let me pause right here. Daniel, Belteshazzar, has served 
Nebuchadnezzar for decades. He came as a boy. Now, 30, 40 years have passed, and he's been faithful. Faithfully living for the true and living God in a heathen, ungodly world. And so now he has an audience with Nebuchadnezzar. And so now he, he's developed a friendship, man, with the king. And so he's troubled by this dream because he knows what it means. It says, Belteshazzar replied, Sir, if only the dream were for your enemies and its interpretation applied to your adversaries, but the tree that you saw that grew large and strong, whose top reached the sky and which could be seen in the land, whose foliage was attractive and its fruits plentiful and from which there was no, a food available for all under whose branches and wild animals used to live and in whose branches birds of the sky used to nest, it's you. He says, boss, this is not about the people you conquer. This is about you in particular in your rosy little world, in your happy little home. In that place where you enjoy the prosperity that God has given you. In that place where life is good in your hood. This dream, this tree is you. And then he says, O king, for you have become great and strong. And your greatness is such that it reaches to the heaven and your authority to the ends of the earth. As for the king, seeing a holy sentinel coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its taproot in the ground with a band of iron and bronze around it surrounded by the grass of the field, let it become damp with the dew of the sky and let it live with the wild animals until seven periods of time go by. Hold on. Go by. Go back. Go back one slide. Go by for him. Now all of a sudden this dream, this vision that Nebuchadnezzar has had, it moves from an inanimate object, a, a, a tree. It goes from an it to a personal pronoun, him. It changes from that tree to this person. Now he goes on, he says, this is the interpretation, O king. It is the decision of the Most High. <laughs> Pause right there. Let me just tell you something. When God makes a decision, you and I uh, can just live with it. There's no changing God. He's an unchanging God. So when he makes a decision, uh, we live by the decision he's made, regardless of the consequences. So he says, the decision of the Most High, that this has happened to my Lord, the king. You will be driven from human society. You will live with wild animals. You will be fed grass like oxen. And you will become damp with the dew of the sky. Seven periods of time will pass by for you before you understand that the Most High is the ruler over human kingdoms and gives them to whomever he wishes. They said to leave the taproot of the tree for your kingdom will be restored to you when you come to understand that heaven rules. Now, this is the prophetic will of God. He tells Nebuchadnezzar, you've had this dream, but it's more than a dream. Uh, dreams are real. We, we've shared that. I've had dreams and visions that I, that they, that I don't know what exactly how they're going to unfold, and yet they do. Just like God said. This morning I was having a conversation with uh, one of our worship team, and, uh, and he has a baby that's like two. And they're pregnant again with two. <laughs> yeah. And so they go to the doctor, and they found out they're having twins. So they're going to have three under the age of two. <laughs> yeah, pray for that family, okay? And send diapers and love, okay? And now, here's what's funny about it. What's that got to do with the dream? His mother-in-law told him uh, a few months back, says, I've had th this dream twice that you all are having twins. And he said, well, you're dreaming of somebody else's family. And he went in for the ultrasound. And, and you know how you go in the ultrasound? And even though they are amazing now, when you first go into the ultrasound, when Kendra and I had our kids, we went to the ultrasound, and it was like a bad reception on your TV. You know, it was just, you know what I mean? And, and you know, the, 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 the technician is saying, oh, it looks good. Look, there's her little kidneys developing just fine. You saw, I ask him, you see any kidneys on there? No kidneys on there. Oh, look, his, his bladder's developing. Look at his little spinal cord. Oh, and he's got ten toes. There's no toes. There's no bladder. There's no kidney. There's just, psh, that's all we got. But in the middle of all that, psh, there's something that's very distinguishable. Dum, 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 a little heartbeat, okay? If you've ever seen that, you know. I mean, you can't, that ain't a bladder. It's not a kidney. It's not toes. It's a heartbeat, okay? And he said he's standing there, and she's rubbing that thing, and he's looking. He goes, dum, 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 dum. I said, oh, no, she was right. 
And they're having two. Now, I say that to say God often reveals things in dreams and visions. Now, we have to be careful in discerning if our dreams and visions are a dream and a vision from God or if it's just we ate too much salsa over at El Matate because that can cause some bad dreams and visions, you know? And, and so here's how you know. If your dreams and your visions are in alignment with the eternal counsel, the inerrant, infallible, forever word of God, then you can, you can kind of begin to consider them in your decision making well here's what's happened he's been given this this dream that the w prophetic will of God about how things are going to be now he tells him he says listen that tree is you and king it's going to be cut down okay why he said because you have not given God the glory it's all been about you yourself and you right it's all about what he's accomplished and, and so he says you're going to become like an animal you're going to eat like animals we're going to find out in a few minutes you're going to grow so much hair it looks like the feathers of an eagle your fingernails are going to go unkept and they're going to become like talons okay and you're going to be in a cage he told us there in an iron and bronze cage for seven years these people are going to look at you and you're going to be a different person it's called monomania in today's psychological world. It's where part of you just goes a little crazy. You know, you wear your underwear on the outside, wear a tin full hat so you can talk to people from other planets. That's who he became. I mean, really messed up. There's another word. It's called uh, lycanthropy. Lycanthropy. Now, I didn't know this growing up. Did not know this about this story. I like it, okay? Lycanthropy is, comes from two words, lycos and anthropos. Lycos is the word for a wolf, okay? Anthropos is mankind. So he became like a werewolf. That's who, you know, the werewolf of London. Now you got the werewolf of Babylon hanging out in his cage with hair like feathers and fingernails like claws and talons. Everything's going to change. Now listen, he, he, you got to think about who he was and who he's becoming. Now I want you to notice that there's a prescriptive warning of a friend. Okay? Anytime you're in a bad place, it's good when God sends friends. Not just any friend. There are people who say they're your friends, but they don't want what's best for you because they're ungodly friends. In this world, God has called us as believers. That's the reason church exists, the bride of Christ. It's for Christians, believers, people who have been born again, people who are on a journey with God, searching for God, living in the rightness of Jesus' gift on a cross, that we come together and we encourage each other and we help each other in our darkest times. Nebuchadnezzar's in a dark world. He's, he's realizing, man, everything's going good, and yet this dream says everything's going to get chopped down. Everything is, and I'm going to become an animal. Along comes Belteshazzar, Daniel, and he gives him an encouraging word. Listen what happens. He says in verse 27, Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away from your sins by doing what is right and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps your prosperity will be prolonged. It, it's good to have Christian friends who will help us. Because sometimes we look in our world and we're like, why is this happening? And what am I doing wrong? And there's people, godly people, who come along to help us in those difficult times. As a pastor... I'm going to share it, be vulnerable with you. One of the absolute most frustrating things, I'll tell you what, what does frustrate preachers, pastors, and I'm not alone. If you don't go here, you go to another, it frustrates your pastor too. Here, unfaithfulness, you know, hit or miss, I'm coming when, I get, when it's comfortable for me. That frustrates a preacher. You know, it just does. You can't help it. Sorry, okay? Not. And, and I'll tell you what else frustrates the preacher, okay? It frustrates the preacher when, when, uh, in, in a worship team, when people don't sing, they say they're born again, and you hear these, see these words, and if you just read them, and, and it should move you, and, and it don't, and that frustrates the preacher. And when people want to experience all the blessings of God, and yet they don't dive in and, and live for God, and they wonder why they don't experience the blessings of, of God, it frustrates the pastor. But here's the greatest, you ready? People in the church family, one of my jobs is pastor. I didn't ask for the job. God called me to do it. I do it. And one of the things he's given me is the ability and a desire, believe it or not, to help people. Listen, if you come to the church at Sturkey Hills, I want to tell you something about the pastor here. It just happens to be me, okay? You're, the pastor here cares about all the people in the church. If you hurt, Kendra knows I hurt. If you hurt, if, if, if you're broken, the Lord knows I'm broken. If you're struggling, the Lord knows I struggle with you. I pray for you. I encourage you. I want to help you. Here's what frustrates. People will say, hey, pastor, can I talk to you? 
yeah, come on in. I'm having a problem in my relationship with my spouse. I'm having a problem in a relationship with my children. I'm having a problem with substance in my life. I'm having a problem in my finances. I'm having a problem in my daily walk with God, in my faithfulness, in Bible reading and prayer time. I have a problem. I have a problem. And the Holy Spirit, because I've been doing it for a long time, often he gives me encouraging words from this book to help people get on the right path. Just like Belteshazzar, Daniel told the king, he says, listen, let this advice be pleasing. If you'll do what I'm telling you to do, I think your kingdom may extend. Your prosperity may continue. Okay? And so that's what I do. I say, listen, I hear what you're saying, man. God's a big God. He's a big God, and he'll help your situation, whatever it might be. He'll step into your world, and he'll provide, and he'll move, and he'll change it. And, and, and here's the prescription. I'm going to give you a prescription straight out of this book because this is a book of prescription. Okay, here's what it says to do. If you will do what this says in this book, I believe God will change and intervene and step into the middle of it and affect your life for the better. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. And then they leave, and they never take the prescription they never do what God's counsel says to do and what it is they're struggling with continues to fall it continues to mess up their life and I believe God sends people into our life to help us uh, discern God's will apply it to our life and experience healing experience God's freshness in our world number five I want you to see the prideful nature of man. He's been given good counsel from a godly friend. He's been told what he needs to do to make things get better. And, and said, how does it turn out? It turns out like it does in our world today. The prideful nature of man. I want you to understand our default mode is to think about how great we are. Is to be consumed with pride. Look what happens in this verse. In this story, verse 28 says, Now all of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, after 12 months, so a year goes by since he's gotten counsel from Daniel, and, and he still hasn't repented and done things God, God's way. He says, after 12 months, he happened to be walking around on the battlements of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king uttered these words. All right, let me pause right here. So he goes out on the porch, right? And he's looking around like, man, I'm, <laughs> look at this place. Man, I am good, right? You remember uh, about 500 years before, there was another king who messed up when he went out on the porch? David went out, and he saw Bathsheba taking a shower. Let me just give you a warning. Stay off the porch. There's something bad going on on the porch. All right? And so he goes out on the porch, and listen to what he says. He doesn't go out and say, God, look what you've done. My, my. And I get to be a part of it. This is what he says. He says, is this not the great Babylon that I have built for a royal residence by my own mighty strength and for my majestic honor? Right? Right? I mean, is this not, look what I've done. Look at the amazing nature of me. Now, we knew he had an ego problem when he lathed a statue in gold, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, because he knew the only thing this world could stand more of, and that's me. Right? And so he made this statue. Now, we all have can find reasons to become prideful. We all do become prideful. And I want you to know God is not picking on Nebuchadnezzar. God hates pride. He hates it. A few things in the Bible that says God hates, he hates pride. And I'll show you in just a minute. But why was Nebuchadnezzar so prideful? Well, why was it so easy for him to dive in and say, look at the greatness of me. Look what I've built. Let me tell you about his kingdom. You ready? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a biblical character, but we also have much, much, much in extra-biblical writings that talk about the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. He he's ranks right up there with Genghis Khan and some of the greatest world leaders in the history of mankind. His kingdom, check this out, his walls were 387 feet tall. Right? 40 stories, like a third of the Empire State Building. His wall. At the top... It was 87 feet wide. The, he had a, tr a, a chariot track at the top of his 387 feet tall wall. A chariot track, 87 feet wide. For entertainment, they would do chariot races around the wall. Okay, N not only that, but how big was this kingdom? Each wall, four 
equal sides, 15 miles long. So a chariot race was 60 miles. You know, the horse gets back, come on, where's the water? All right. And, and right through the middle of the kingdom, the Euphrates River would flow so they could draw water. You want to hear one of the coolest things? Now, men, this will trump every gift you've ever given your wife. I don't care about the biggest diamond, the trip to Hawaii. Got nothing on Neb, okay? For a gift for his wife, he built a hanging garden over the palace. Listed as one of the seven great wonders of the ancient world. The whole top of the palace was like a garden of draping flowers for his wife. <laughs> yeah, that little bouquet you got your wife, nothing, okay? This is his kingdom. He had every reason, every right, if anybody does, to go out on the porch and say, Oh, man, it's good to be me. Okay? Look at all that I have done. But you remember what Daniel told him? He says, King, if you will repent, and if you will begin to appreciate God, who's given you everything you have, I think your prosperity will be prolonged. Pride is an evil player. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 6.16 6, about pride. It says, <clears throat> there are six things that the Lord hates, even seven things that are an abomination to him. It goes on, it says the first one, pride. Then it goes on in uh, Proverbs 16.5, the Lord abhors every arrogant person. Rest assured that they will not go unpunished. We read in Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride and the evil way and, and perverse utterances. We read in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. We read in Proverbs 11, excuse me, in James I think is the next one. Right there, James 4, 6. But he gives greater grace. Therefore it says God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. God hates pride. And yet the prideful nature of man is everywhere that we live. Now, what does that have to do with us? Because welcome to America, 2020, where we live the American nightmare, I mean the American dream, where we accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. We spend money we don't have on things we don't need to impress people we don't know. That's, what we, that's, that's our life. We want a bigger house and a fancier car and a nicer boat and a fancier vacation and nicer clothes. Oh, that's just me? That's not you all? I thought it was everybody. It is everybody. Okay? It's the world we live in. And every time we accumulate something and put it on display, it's because we have this prideful root deep within us that has to be overcome. We live in an amazing time in God's eternal kingdom. I believe it's the latter days of the church. I believe it's the latter days <clears throat> before Jesus returns for his children. I believe and I know that, that there's no prophetic word left un, um, unfulfilled that keeps Jesus from returning for his church. And I believe at any time the Lord could hear the trumpet blow, and he could come and, and catch away the church, those dead and those alive. And, and, and I believe that it, it, that it all comes to an end, and I think we're living in the last day. Paul thought the same thing, but I believe it today. I believe it's when we read prophecy and, and God's Word and we look at the events in our world, it seems like we're in the latter times. And all the while, God is still reaching out to us in hopes of connecting with us. And moving us from that place, like Nebuchadnezzar, where we knew about a God, but we didn't know the God. Where we had a relationship with somebody else's faith, rather than having our own. And I believe today, that's the message, that before we can receive that, we, like Nebuchadnezzar, have to realize that we have become comfortable and content and satisfied in our own little world. Meanwhile, there's a greater God reaching into the heart of it, inviting us to, to a personal, intimate walk with God. This passage began with Nebuchadnezzar saying, Man, I'm, it's my pleasure to tell you 
what God has done for me. And I want to ask you a serious question today. Do you have that testimony? Can you say, hey, world, it's my pleasure to tell you what God has done for me. Regardless of what God has done for that person or that person or that person or that person, it's my pleasure in the middle of this pandemic world, in the middle of social unrest, in the middle of this political fiasco, it's my pleasure to be able to tell you what God has done for me. I want you to bow your heads, and I just want to ask you a question. If today you're living based on somebody else's relationship with God, could it be that you found yourself here on this day for the God of somebody else to become your God? That you showed up not expecting what God wants to give you. And maybe on this day, it's your day, just like Nebuchadnezzar had his day, just like your pastor had a day, just like maybe a friend had a day, that maybe this is your day when God has reached down into your heart and invited you into his presence for a forever walk with the God of the universe. And if that, this is your day, here's how you respond. You drop the pride. You don't worry about what anybody else thinks. You don't worry about what has happened in the past. And you simply say, God... I am in awe that on this day you would choose to reach from heaven and touch the depth of my soul, inviting me into your presence so it's no longer just a profession, the words of my mouth, but it can become a possession, the experience of my heart. God, I give all of my brokenness to you in exchange for all of the perfection of Jesus, your son. The fact that he came and died on a cross for my sin just blows my mind. But God, I want to receive what Jesus has offered me, forgiveness and grace and life in exchange for all of my sinfulness, for all of my curse, for all of my mistakes. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Seal me, mark me as your child from this day, from this day forward, so that I will be, have pleasure in telling other people about what you did for me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving my soul on this day. And for the rest of us, maybe it's time that we just get back to that moment where we say, God, I've squandered the gift. God, I have not lived according to the greatness that you gave me in Jesus, your son, when he entered my life. From this day forward, let me, like Nebuchadnezzar, boldly proclaim that it is my pleasure to tell the world what God has done for me. If you prayed to receive Christ today, I would encourage you to let me or somebody know because it needs to be public. If today you're rededicating your life to live more fully and freely to Jesus, there's an altar down here. I would encourage you to come and pray that God would strengthen you. Father, thank you for this word today. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who moves in our heart to help us moving forward. Thank you for being a God of multiple chances like you were in Nebuchadnezzar's life and like you are in our life today. Thank you for always loving the unlovable and that's us. We give you this moment. We ask that your Holy Spirit would help us respond as you would have it. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Let me invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song and then we'll be dismissed.